Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Breakfast Club, which is welcoming back Dr. Louise Rocha, ichthyology curator at the California Academy of Sciences. Hey, Louise. Hi, everybody. Hi, Laura. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So last time you were here, you did this really fascinating talk on coral reefs, the threats they're facing, the work that you and other people are doing to um, explore and protect them. And everyone was like, huh, that's really interesting. But oh my God, those photos. So we brought you back to talk about like two kind of main areas. One, underwater photography, because uh, you're a little bit good at it. It's like part of your work. I think you, I heard you've taken 50,000 underwater photos in the course of publishing 150 scientific papers. Which about is like that, or yeah, a little yeah, impressive. I don't know. A little know. bit. It's fine. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but it's also clearly a passion. So um, yeah. that's like exciting. And I'm like, I saw some little previews of your presentation, and I feel like I feel like people are in for a treat. Uh, and then the second kind of general area is just like, what makes someone fall in love with a fish when that fish is not Daryl Hannah and Splash? Um, and that I think is uh, like something I've seen bits and pieces of your story about, but I'm like excited to see more because you actually like really like those fish, don't you? Oh yeah, absolutely. You're just all of them except for gobies. Yeah, so you're a little bit famous on Twitter um, for beautiful fish pictures and also for being like really mean to gobies. Like I think you actually own the hashtag nasty gobies, which leads to my first they hard hitting. Yeah, well that leads to my first um, hard hitting question, which is what makes a goby nasty? They're too small. I can't tell them apart. My eyes are going. I'm I'm over forty now, so I can't see clothes anymore. So I can't tell them apart anymore without reading glasses. Wait, so they're they're nasty because they're inconvenient to an aging yeah. scientist? Bit too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that wasn't like I thought there was going to be a lot more. That was going to get no, a lot more descriptive. That's, that's I thought it. it was going to be more descriptive and less pathetic. <laughs> All right. Well, Twitter people, uh, while you debate whether or not Louise still has your respect, or if you had ever had it to start with. I'll hand this over to Louise for Thanks a for... photographic voyage of adventure. Thank you so much again for coming back. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you. Okay, so I hope um, I hope I don't bore anybody because it's it's going to be a long story, a, a long history, and I'll start uh, I'll start in the beginning. I'll start where I came from. Um, but before I do that, I want to apologize. Some of the photos, they are not the quality that I'm, I'm supposed to be sharing them on. Um, I like sharing like really high quality photos, but sadly, as a lot of people are these days, I'm stuck at home and all of my original photos are back in the office, which is closed right now. So I, can't, I don't have access to the office. So a lot of the photos that I'm sharing are kind of low resolution. They're going to look a little bad in your screen, but um, I can redo this presentation again when I have access to my real photos next time. Um, so uh, this is where our, it all started. I'm originally from João Pessoa in Brazil. That's where the, the uh, white arrow is pointing that. Uh, it's uh, the easternmost um, city in Brazil. So it's that hump of Brazil. It's on the very tip of it. Um, and it's on the coast. And I grew up going to those coastal reefs that I fell in love with uh, really early uh, in my life. Uh, since middle school, I knew I wanted to be a biologist. Um, in high school, I, uh, I personally wrote a proposal and took to the mayor of my town to make that reef on that photo there. It's called Piconzinho. Um, I grew up going and snorkeling there, and I, I saw, if you see those little boats in the area there, I saw the, um, the tourism and fishing on that reef was having a large impact on the reef. It was basically destroying it. And um, back in the late 80s, I took a proposal to the mayor of my hometown to uh, transform this into a, a, a marine reserve of some sort to stop it from being degraded so quickly. And uh, I was unsuccessful. A lot of people after me tried. There's some protection right now, but not enough really. So it's still being degraded, mostly because it's very close to the town. So if you look at the horizon there in the picture, all of those big buildings are um, uh, where the town is and then uh, people have access to it. So if they're close to it, they're gonna come to see it like uh, um, everybody else would, I guess, in, in such a coastal nice town like that. Um, so that's a little bit of my background. Uh, when I grew up, uh, we were a simple family. I didn't have any money to go diving, to buy dive gear. Uh, diving is a very expensive activity. So uh, the, the, the only thing I could do was become a dive master. So when I was in high school, I did my uh, uh, open water course. It was the first course that was taught by the, the instructor at the time. 
And then for the second course, he needed dive masters. And I, I was one of the ones that offered. Um, but interestingly, I, I used to get seasick all the time. So I didn't become one because I was getting seasick all the time. And eventually I become used to getting seasick and working while I was seasick. And then it kind of all went away. And now I rarely get seasick anymore. So if you're seasick and if you get seasick and you think, oh, I can't be a marine biologist because I get seasick. No, that's uh, uh, not an excuse. You can overcome that easily as I did. Um, and that's also when my love for underwater photography uh, started. So a lot of the divers that did the course, they had cameras. I didn't have my own camera. It took me a long time to buy my first camera. Um, but I borrowed cameras all the time. And this is one of the first uh, pictures I took. It's one of those that is kind of low quality for two reasons. One, because it's a film scan. So back then in the early 90s, mid 90s, there were no uh, digital cameras yet. Um, uh, if there's any kids or actually anybody that was born after 2000 or so won't even know what a film camera is. Um, but there were no digital cameras back then. So the quality on that photo is not that great. It's a scanned slide. Um, and it's a low resolution scan so the high resolution ones are in the office. Um, but I, I started my passion. I started borrowing cameras, taking pictures. And uh, one of the first tips I want to give you about underwater photography here is that um, uh, there are uh, you can pick subjects to get good with uh, when you start, and uh, and the more pictures you take, the better you get, and the easier this. There's easy subjects and hard subjects to photograph, and moray eels in general are a relatively easy subjects. So this being one of the first underwater photos that I took doesn't make me a, a master photographer. It just tells you that it's easy to get close to a moray to take a photograph of. And, uh, and uh, with that, I bring you the second tip for underwater photography, which is what I just said, just get close. So the closer you are to the subject, the more light you're gonna get on it from your strobes or from the reflected light of the subject and the better the, the, the the uh, the picture looks um, so because mores are really easy to get close to they're an easy and they're not shy they're not scared in 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 general of divers they're an easy subject to photograph so whenever you see one get close to it take a lot of pictures and um, and uh, you'll find some good ones in there for sure because they don't swim away um, so right around that time uh, this is where the the, the crazy trip uh, insane adventures uh, stories start uh, right around that time so up to that point I was I was a trained diver and I did a lot of diving but it was all in my hometown in João Pessoa in Brazil so about that time maybe early to mid 90s I started doing expeditions going further trying to learn more I became an undergraduate in biology I went to college in my hometown in João Pessoa um, I started studying biology, and with that, uh, I had the first opportunity to go out and explore a little further. This is one of the first places I visited as a college student. An amazing, amazing experience. It's Atal das Rocas in Brazil. It's the only atoll. An atoll is a ring of coral. In this case, it's not really coral. It's uh, invertebrates that form the, the ring in the atoll. But it's the only formation like this in the whole entire uh, South Atlantic. There's a couple, a few in the Caribbean, but this is the only one in the South Atlantic. It's about 150 miles offshore, um, maybe 200 miles from my hometown, but it's up north. Uh, so it's 150 miles from the closest point on shore. And uh, it's a tiny little island. There's only one research station. There's a picture of the research station there. Um, I'll go back to the other picture that if you look closely, you see uh, on the top of the ring, there's two, two little islands. So those are the two only points in the island that remain dry in, uh, in high tide. Everything else is underwater. Um, and that's where the research station is and it was one of those, uh, in one of those two um, spots. And um, the second time, so I went there two times, and the way it works is you take a boat, uh, the, the Brazilian Environmental Agency, which was Ibama at the time, um, takes you there, and then they drop you off. They drop off four scientists, and then you stay for a month, and the boat comes back. The second time I went there, the way they, they replenish the food there is very interesting. They don't want to waste any food like nobody else does. So they, they communicate with radio with the team that is going out about the quantity of food they have left. 
and there was a miscommunication like unlucky for me so when i got there with the food that i thought was going to last me for a month we didn't have enough food um because the the the, the team that was outgoing uh didn't communicate very well the amount of food that was left uh, so when we put together the, the whatever was left to whatever we brought we, we thought there wasn't enough food but we thought there was enough water so we decided to stay anyways um we knew there was a lot of fish around the island that we could survive on and that's what we did we spent uh, four weeks there um in the first two weeks we ran out of food um, and we just kept living out of what the ocean provided and it does and in this case it provides a lot because this is a biological reserve in brazil and um, I didn't even need to go far from the beach to get uh, uh, one fish a day to eat. Um, it was very interesting doing that to two weeks, not knowing what we're gonna get in the next day, if anything. Um, the other thing I started doing a lot at this time was going to conferences. And um, if you were thinking about becoming a marine biologist or a biologist or a scientist in general, that's something that a lot of scientists do. And this, this photo is, very significant to me for many reasons. Um, uh, from left to right there, that's Sergio Floater, then myself, then Carlos Ferreira. Claudia uh, is in the center there. Uh, and at the time, she was my girlfriend. And now she's my wife. That was uh, quite a while ago. It was in the mid 90s. Then Carlos Rangel, João Gasparini, Bertrand, and Thelma, all biologists, all my good friends. And we all still work together to this date. Um, Something else that I started doing at that time uh, was uh, not only taking pictures, but also working on taxonomy. So I started finding new species. Uh, and this one it was the first one that I described, the first one that I named right off of my hometown, Himilon Squamipina. And it took me a long time to convince myself that it was actually new and that it wasn't missing anything because it was one of the most common species off of my hometown. Um, and um, and uh, I thought somebody else had described it before. Somebody else had to describe it before. So it took me a long time to describe it, but I finally got around um, to describing it. And uh, and I started taking more pictures. It's still with a borrowed camera. Um, um, and, and something interesting started happening. I started noticing there was a lot of differences between the species from my hometown and the species that I, uh, I were on the books. And I had to come up with a new technique uh, uh, to kind of study them. So this is uh, one of the examples. On the left there is Helicaris radiatus, and on the right is Helicaris brasiliensis. Those are two species of grass. The one on the left is from the Caribbean, the one on the right is from Brazil. But when I was in Brazil and I took those pictures, uh, and I got the picture on the right, and I lightly compared to the one in the Caribbean, all of the identification books that I had were based on the Caribbean fauna, and they were all telling me that the species I had, the one on the right in, in Brazil, was actually the same as the one on the left. So those two were considered the same species. When you look at their underwater photography like that, um, the color is so different that you immediately conclude that they're different on, uh, species. They're not the same. Um, but the way people do taxonomy or did taxonomy until... 30 or 40 years ago was only based on specimens that were on museums, which are completely discolored. So they're preserved in, in formalin, um, they're fixed in formalin, preserved in alcohol. And that process makes their, almost all of their color go away. So when you look at the fish in a jar after it's dead, a specimen, they look very, very similar. So if you look at their body shapes, their general body shape is very similar. So if you didn't have the underwater photography of the one in Brazil, which nobody did because nobody was taking underwater photography in Brazil, you thought the Brazilian one was the same as the Caribbean one. Um, and um, it, 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 it's some taxonomy is, is, a, is, a, is a scientist, is a science, is something that tends to be very conservative. So if you wanna say a species is new and different than something else, you need a lot of evidence. You need a lot of support to split those species to say that they're really different. Um, but when the only thing you have is color, people usually, in general, they don't believe, they don't accept that they are different. So that was about 1998, 1999, and there was an emerging field um, uh, that was just starting, it was, which was DNA sequencing. And nobody was doing it in Brazil. No labs were equipped enough to do it. Now everybody does it everywhere. Um, but back in the mid to late 90s, nobody was doing it. So that led me to move 
um, moved to the US actually. So I was doing my master's at the time and I moved to the US um, to uh, do uh, my PhD. So I was doing a master's degree, then I moved to the US to do my PhD. And the main reason for that was because I wanted to study genetics. So I wanted to sequence the DNA of those two fish and several other fish that I thought were slightly different from the ones in the Caribbean to see, confirm if they were different or not. And that led me to move, um, to, move uh, to the US to do my PhD. Um, this one uh, that was the photo I took in the last, so this was the last expedition I did in Brazil before I moved to the US. Again, in the left there, you see Sergio. Um, the one in the hat is Ross Robertson, which later was my one of the fish gurus out there, which later was became my postdoc supervisor when I went to the Smithsonian in Panama. Then Gasparini again and myself. I mean, we were uh, doing dive in some cold waters off of the Espiritu Santo state. So right after this trip, I moved uh, uh, to the U.S. to do my PhD at the University of Florida with Brian Bowen. Brian is the one uh, with the green shirt there. This is a photo I took a little later. One of those with the low resolution because the original, again, is in the academy, locked up in my office. Um, and um, uh, Brian was my PhD advisor and then was my postdoc advisor again when I came back to Hawaii to do a postdoc. Uh, the one on the hat, the short one on the hat there is Howard Schott, one of my other mentors from James Cook University and Matt Craig, uh, the one in the blue shirt, is, uh, was my postdoc. Uh, a postdoc with me in Hawaii when I was doing a postdoc there. Both of us were doing postdocs at the same time. Um, so when I was in Florida, I still had the, sa the same film camera and I was still traveling around the road. Uh, this was uh, another photo I took with a film camera that I was amazed and stunned to get. So one of the things I like a lot photographing is fish behavior, fish interactions. And, um, and um, this was one of the last pictures I took with my film camera. I had a Nikon F100, so I am a Nikon guy. Here's one of my cameras here. This is a Nikon D500. Oops, where's my camera? So that's the that's the one I use right now. If if anybody tells you they use Canon, don't trust them. They're bad people. Canon people are bad. Nikon people are good. <laughs> um, starting another Twitter fight right there. Um, so this one I took with a Nikon F100, which was one of the latest film cameras that Nikon produced. And if you look closely, there's another fish in the mouth of that fish there. So that's a Kinopsid Blaney from Venezuela. And uh, it, it was eating another fish of the same species in this case, which I thought was very, really curious. But that was one of the last, uh, one of the last film uh, photos I took. After that, I moved on to digital. And digital photography opens up all kinds of, of possibilities for the photographer, not only just underwater photography, but for the photographer in general. So with film, you're limited to those 36 exposures. You are always conserving and not photographing as much as you, you should um, because you, you, you know you only have 36 shots. But with, the, with a digital camera, that's very different. You're, you have unlimited number of, of pictures to take. Um, in a, a, I took sometimes I take, I don't know, 50 or 60 photos in a one hour dive. So it's more than a photo a minute. Um, you can't obviously you can't do that in a, uh, with a with a film camera unless you you're really really pro and with unlimited resources and you dive with multiple cameras which people did back then, uh, but now you don't need to do that anymore because you have a digital camera it's kind of unlimited. And then uh, I got a digital camera. It was a Nikon D two X. I still have the housing that I use for that. So this is um, and the camera too. This is a Nike uh, a Subao housing for the Nikon. Uh, D2X, which was one of the first uh, Nikon cameras. Um, it's a really big housing because it's a really big camera. It's one of those professional Nikon cameras that's really big. It's bigger than the one I have now, the D500, uh, but the D500 is more modern. Um, um, but with digital cameras, you kind of start getting into the high quality stuff that I always wanted to get underwater and the, the interesting behaviors. And here's another tip about underwater photography in general. Um, so with the digital camera, it gives you the chance to photograph um, a lot, take a lot of pictures in the same dive. And, and the more pictures you take, the more good pictures you end up with. So if you imagine that 10% of your photos are gonna be good, which is a good average, I think my 5% of my photos are good. Um, the more pictures you take, the more good pictures you end up with. Um, but the other secret 
not only the first one is taking a lot of pictures, the second one is is being at the right place at the right time. So it's just like real estate, location, location, location. And um, and uh, and depending on the subject, time, time, time. So in this case, here's a pair of uh, hamlets in the Caribbean. This photo I took in Belize in one of the first trips I did with my, uh, my brand new at the time, Nikon D2X. Um, and I really wanted to photograph those fish spawning because I know they have this incredible courtship behavior and they when they spawn they embrace each other like that uh, it's just mind-blowing but they only do it for like five or ten minutes at the most right before sunset and it's only in a few places where they're in, in high concentrations so um, you have to find the right spot so we dove during the day to find the right places and then right before sunset we would go specifically to photograph them spawning so i have about i don't know 200 photos of them spawning like that and uh, this is the, the the only one that I would probably, the only one that I would show publicly because the other ones are just bad. Um, um, but in addition to being location specific and time specific, the bio, the whole biology of this interaction with this fish is just mind blowing. I have no better word for it, no better expression for it. Um, the, uh, uh, they are simultaneous hermaphrodites. Um, so they change, they, they are, they have both, there's a lot of fish that are hermaphrodites, but they change sex during their life. So when they're, they start off as females and then as they grow older, they become males. And they're never the two sexes at the same time. These guys, these fish are, have, they're both male and female functionally at the same time. So they have gonads, they produce eggs and sperm at the same time. But they don't want to fertilize their own eggs. So they don't want that their sperm fertilize their own eggs. So what they do is they switch roles as this is happening. So they go up in the water column, like, I don't know, maybe half an hour before sunset, they start going up in the water column and they go up and one behaves as a male, the other one behaves as a female. They embrace each other like that in the photo. Um, they spawn, the eggs and sperm come up, they, they fertilize each other, and then they go back down to the reef, they switch sex. The one that was male becomes a female. The one that was female becomes a male. They go up again, they do it again. But now the male is the different one, the female is a different one, they go down. And then they switch again, and they go up and they go down. They do this 10 or 20 times, um, half an hour before sunset, um, uh, every day. That's why you can go back and then take a better picture the next day and go back and take a better picture. And what's, that's what we did. We spent about a week there going back to the same spot, trying to get the best possible photo. And I'm, I was really happy with this one. Um, the other thing about fish behavior, so sometimes behavior like I just showed with the spawning is predictable. Um, many times it's not, it's just chance. And this one is one of those examples. A, a lot of fish out there, some wrasses, some um, uh, grunts, which these are grunts of the genus Hemilum. So the same genus of fish that I showed that the species, I, the first one I described from my, uh, uh, from my hometown in Brazil. This one I took in Florida, in the Florida Keys. And those uh, grunts, they organize themselves in big schools and uh, they have a hierarchy, they have a ranking or the dominant fish and the less dominant fish. And they establish their rank by kind of having these territorial contests. They kind of push one another with their mouths. Um, but they don't do it in a predictable way. They can, you can spend the whole day looking at them and they'll never do it. Or you can kind of look at the, uh, the corner of your eye and, uh, and you see them doing it. And that was one of those cases. I was, I was swimming by a school of these guys. I had a lot of pictures of them already, so I didn't particularly want to photograph them. But when I saw them doing this, I stopped everything I was doing and I immediately photographed it. And this is the one photo I took and then they stopped doing it and they didn't do it for the rest of the dive. Um, so one of those opportunistic things, one of those behaviors that rarely happens. And when you see it, if you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, you just take the shot. So sometimes it's technique and knowing when and where to be. And other times it's, um, it's, uh, just luck. Like in this case, um, this is another one of those cases where it's more like technique and being at the right place at the right time. So this was in Panama. So after I, uh, I finished my PhD at the University of Florida, I moved to Panama. As I said, Ross Robertson was my postdoc advisor in Panama. And uh, we did a lot of uh, uh, diving in uh, per Islas Perlas, which is about an hour boat drive in the Pacific side of Panama. Um, 
uh, in the Pacific side of Panama, uh, off of uh, uh, Panama City in Panama. And um, uh, the first day I went there, I started noticing these um, Kinopsid blennies, that's uh, Emblemaria hancocki in there, uh, the red eye uh, Kinopsid blenny. And uh, they live in the holes that were left behind uh, drilling uh, worms in those corals. It's a small little fish, a tiny fish, Kinopsid blenny. Um, and it lives in those holes. And, and I started, I mean, I, I started seeing the potential but I didn't quite find the right scene. So I kept going back to the same coral heads in the same area and taking more and more pictures until I found this one, which was a nice background, a nice foreground. The fish was looking directly into the camera. So I have about, I don't know, 200 photos of the same species, the same two species there, the same coral and the same fish that don't look nearly as nice as this. Um, this one was the one shot that kind of made my, all of my outings there uh, uh, worth it. Um, and this is, I think, my only picture where I won a major underwater photography contest with. Um, so back uh, on that time, um, I was really into underwater photography. I had a really nice underwater photography uh, a website, and I was participating in some underwater photography contests. And I submitted this to a, a contest uh, run by Scuba Diving Magazine, and I won the macro category. Of, uh, of that contest, which macro is just the type of lens you use. So if you, you're taking pictures that are close, the subject is very close and, uh, and very small, it's macro photography. And that's what it is there. That fish, the hole in the coral there is less, it's smaller than a penny. So maybe that small. And the fish is tiny too, but it's not a goby. So it's a good fish. It's a keen opposite blaney. Gobies are nasty, blannies are not. So um, after uh, my uh, two years postdoc in Panama, I moved to Hawaii, to the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology. That's beautiful um, Kaneohe Bay and the island uh, on the foreground there is Coconut Islands where the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology is located. Um, I started working with Brian Bowen again and again continuing uh, doing underwater photography because I think the reason I do it is, is because I, it, Everything on the water looks so beautiful to me that I want to show it to everybody. And the best way to do it is by taking pictures like this, I think. So this is um, uh, one of the first trips I did when I was in Hawaii. Uh, we went to the Northwestern Hawaiian Islands uh, on a NOAA cruise. And then we went to Johnston Atoll. This is a picture I took at Johnston Atoll. It's skated on Tinker Eye, Tinker's butterfly fish. And um, um, there's a lot of pictures like this where you kind of isolate the subject and you have a black background. And a lot of people ask me, how do you do that? So it's the same one, the same style as the, the, the spawning hamlets that I showed before. Um, and it's when you, when you get the fish in a dark place, in a dark setting, and you set a high shutter speed. So the camera opens and closes the lens, the, the, the exposes very quickly. And, uh, and it's a dark background then you get the black background like that. In the case of the, of the hamlets, it was because it was close to sunset, so it was dark underwater anyways. In the case of this guy here, we were inside a cave. So when you're inside a cave in a dark spot um, or very deep or close to sunset and you, you, you do a, a picture with a fast shutter speed, there's almost no ambient light that goes in. It's only the flash, uh, the light from the strobe. Um, so it only lights the fish, not the background, and you get these beautiful images that isolate your subject, and the background is black. Um, uh, I did a lot of traveling when I was in Hawaii. One of the most interesting travels was when we went to Kwajalein Atoll. So this is a, post, a picture I posted uh, in the, the Twitter wars today to show the Gobi people what a nice fish looks like. This is an orange-spotted filefish that I photographed in Kwajalein Atoll in the Marshall Islands. And then I started doing um, wide angle photos, uh, which I haven't done much of up until that point. I was only focusing on photographing fish, but I started photographing reefs too. I mean, I wanted to show people the home uh, of the fishes, um, basically. Um, so this is one of those that I took, I won a, a wide angle photo I took in, in Kwajalein. Brian Green was one of my dive buddies. He's, he was one that uh, took us around during that trip. And uh, uh, for the wide angle one, let me show you, pull back my housing here. So this is a, a wide angle, let me pull this out. This is a wide angle port, oops, that way. 
a dome port. So the dome port is, uh, it's all dirty, mostly because I haven't used this camera in 10 years maybe, uh, five years. Yeah, 2010 is when I, I retired it. But the way you take those uh, over, like half under, under half over uh, uh, pictures is by putting the water line right here. So right in the middle of the dome port, you have to put the water line. And it's something really hard to do in normal days in the ocean. So normally the ocean is very choppy and windy and there's waves and the more action in the, in the, in the ocean, the harder it is to go to get those pictures. And you have to be swimming up and you hold this kind of against your face like that. So it's, it's, it's really hard. Um, so this is a, a photo I'm really happy with because um, it was really hard to get. And it's very rarely that you get days when you can take those photos because it, they only work, they are only nice like that when it's a really calm day. It's a really flat day and you have the right gear with you, you have the right lens and the right camera. And it's the right time of day to get the nice light on the top and on the bottom. So those are very challenging, uh, very challenging um, um, photos to take. So when I came back from Kwajalein, I had some experience in the Marshall Islands. And um, I was talking to a, a friend of mine from Brazil, Lawrence Waba, and I told him a story that I saw some uh, sharks in the Marshall Islands that didn't have the second dorsal fin. And, and I was wondering why that was. One of the reasons was that, uh, one of the possible reasons could be that uh, the US uh, did a lot of nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands. They did this, exploded a lot of bombs there. And uh, I thought maybe that was the effects of radiation, but nobody knows. And um, if, I, if I wanted to, to really test that i had to go back and, and get samples so i told him that story and he's, he thought it was really curious he even used it in one of his documentaries in brazil and somehow a german tv company saw his documentary in brazil and got really interested in the subject and i got a call out of the blue when i was in hawaii from this german tv company and they were like hey we are mounting this expedition to go to bikini atoll and we heard about your the work you want to do with sharks uh, you want to sample the sharks there to to test for some sort of mutation that caused them to not have the second dorsal fin. What uh, what do you think? You want to come with us? All expenses paid next week, Bikini Atoll. I'm like, um, I think I can make that happen. So I immediately said yes. Um, and one thing that made me a little bit curious was that they um, they asked for my passport and all of my information, and they said that they wanted to run. They needed to run a Interpol background so a very detailed background check on me and that made me a little suspicious but i was so excited with the trip that i said all right here's my information you can do a background check you're not going to find anything anyways so i gave them the information a couple of days later they said here's your ticket you're cleared you're good to go and i was always wondering why did they why did they ask me that why did they ask me for my background why did they do an interpol background check so I flew from Hawaii to Majuro, which was the capital of the Marshall Islands. And when I landed in Majuro, I thought we were going to get on a, a, a research ship of some sort and then go to Bikini. And it turns out this ship was waiting for us there. This is the octopus. At the time, it was the largest private yacht in the planet. So imagine someone that grew up in João Pessoa in Brazil, I'm borrowing underwater cameras to to take pictures with going to Bikini Atoll in one of the most luxurious platforms in the world. It was like a whirlwind for me. I mean, I couldn't believe that was happening. I had to pinch myself many, many times. Um, so we get in the ship. It's the most luxurious thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, it, it's like mind blowing. It took me about a week to get used to the idea that uh, somebody could have that much money. I mean, just to operate that ship is, I don't know, a million dollars a year, something like that, just to keep it running. Um, it belonged to Paul Allen. Sadly, Paul Allen passed away a couple of years ago, but he was a big supporter of coral reef research and marine research in general. And um, uh, he used to, uh, when he was not using the ship personally, he used to allow, uh, TV companies to come on board and use the infrastructure on the ship to do documentaries. 
And that's what happened. So this German TV company somehow got access to somebody that worked at uh, the Octopus. And they were passing by close to the Marshall Islands. They decided to stop and allow the German TV company to bring their team, which included me, um, um, to spend a couple of weeks in the ship doing this documentary about Bikini Atoll, which uh, I think it still airs sometimes in the whole history channel. It's called Radio Radioactive Paradise. And my my participation on the on the on the documentary was to exactly to look for those sharks and try to sample them. And that's what we did for the first few days we were there. Um, and I couldn't find any sharks. I couldn't find any sharks. Um, we started diving. This is one of the most spectacular dives I did. Um, this is uh, the USS Saratoga. It's an aircraft carrier that is sunk in the bottom of the lagoon in Bikini Atoll. It was sunk by one of those nuclear tests. Um, so just the history, the history of the whole thing and the, 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 the thrill of being on that ship. And I couldn't find my sharks, but I wasn't too worried about that because I knew we still had like 10 days or so to the go. But then Paul Allen decided to show up. And when he showed up, we couldn't do anything else because all of the resources on the ship were had to be at his disposal. So long story short, I didn't, I didn't sample any of the sharks that I wanted because I couldn't do it because uh, the, the resources on the boat were, using, were being used for, for something else. But I did got a, not only a good story from a, a, like a conversation point of view, but also a good story from the biological point of view. So when I first was invited to go there, I thought it was going to be like a wasteland. Um, everything was going to be leveled and there was going to be nothing because there were dozens and dozens of nuclear tests that were done there, including the largest nuclear explosion ever created by man was one of the tests they did there. Um, so um, what I saw, in fact, was the opposite. So the last explosion, the last test there, if I'm not mistaken, was done in 1957. Our expedition there was 2006, so almost 50 years later. And what I saw was a thriving, one of the most healthy coral reefs I've ever seen in my life. And the reason for that is quite simple. So after the nuclear tests, there was a lot of ra radiation that was left over. And uh, the, the government didn't want anybody back there. So they kept everybody away from the island. Um, there was no people in the island living for uh, shortly before we went there. I think late 90s, early 2000s, they established a small population. And by small, I mean 10, 15 people in the island. And that's it. Nobody else allowed to fish there because everybody still thinks there's some sort of radiation being carried on and, and passed on to the fish. So there's no fishing. And the result is a thriving ecosystem, one of the best that I've ever seen with a lot of predators. That picture is looking up. Um, there was a bunch of sharks on top of our heads at, at that one dive that we did in one of the channels. Channels are places that naturally um, aggregate sharks. And in this particular one, there was a lot of sharks. Um, um, so, if you leave it alone, it will come back. If we protect them, they, the reefs will come back. Um, so the other thing I did in Hawaii that was one of the highlights in my career was to interact, or to interact a lot with Jack Randall. So again, this is one of those uh, uh, historic pictures. Jack Randall is the one with the Aloha shirt there on the left. Claudia, then my girlfriend, now my wife is the one in the middle there and I'm on the right. And this was in a, a ichthyology conference, the American Society of Ichthyology and Herpetologists Conference in Seattle in 1997. So that was a while ago. And uh, Jack, at the time, uh, reviewed for me. So remember that first species that I described, Himilon squamipina, the one from my hometown? I had a, a stack of paper with the printed version. There was no email back at the time. But the printed version of my... Uh, uh, my description and I gave it to Jack and he went over it. He redlined everything, he edited the whole thing. Jack Randall, if you're not familiar with the ichthyology, uh, with the study of fishes, he is the person who described the most fish in the world. That is um, um, incredibly prolific uh, ichthyologist. The only people that describe more fish than he did were people that lived back in the 1800s that when they went anywhere, all of the fish were still undescribed. So everything was new. But for Jack, um, 
it was a little bit harder because a lot of the species were already described, but he was so committed to it that he pioneered the use of scuba diving. So he's the first one that started scuba diving uh, to uh, study fish. And uh, he collected a lot of reef fish and he described almost a thousand species of coral reef fishes throughout the world, from the Caribbean, from Brazil, from uh, the Indo-Pacific. The Indo-Pacific was really his forte. He was a professor at the University of Hawaii for a long time. He had many, many students. Some of his students are now today the, the biggest names in ichthyology, like Jerry Allen and Rich Pyle, um, Kent Carpenter. A lot of his students became really famous um, ichthyologists. Um, it, it was a dream of mine also to have him as my PhD advisor. But at the time I, I, I was ready to go into a PhD, he was retiring from the University of Hawaii, but he was still very active. He, he was still very, he's still publishing now. He's published, described 10 new species of fish last year. So he's one of those kind of gods of ichthyology that everybody wants to interact with, everybody wants to work with. Um, he won numerous careers awards. He's one of those like maybe the Stephen Hawking of ichthyology or something like that. So um, Jack, when I was in Hawaii, he, he, uh, we, he and I started working together and we, I had the honor and pleasure to describe quite a few species, four or five species of fish with Jack. Um, he led some of them, I led some of them. Um, we described quite a few fish together and one of the fish that we described together was this one which we named Halicaris Claudia. So that's hence the picture there with the three of us in it. So Jack and I described this one and we named it after Claudia, my wife, Halicaris Claudia. It's one of the prettiest fish I've ever described and uh, we named it after Claudia. So taxonomists sometimes have fun too. All right, I'm gonna try to speed it up because I see it's already 1040. Ooh, ooh, it's too much history. So after my time in Hawaii, I went to the University of Texas uh, this is the University of Texas Marine Science uh, Institute. I was a professor there for about three years. Um, and that's when I started going to the Red Sea. So I started collaborating with Mike Berman and Joey DiBattista, who two of the, uh, the two of them I still collaborate with today. Tani and the whole crew from the Red Sea. We do a lot of work together. But when I moved to Texas, I started going to the Red Sea. And the Red Sea was one of the most stunning things I've ever seen. If you're a diver and you haven't been to the Red Sea, put it on your list. It's one of the most fantastic dives you ever see. Um, took a lot of photos there, maybe 10, 20,000 photos between the, the 10, 20 times I went there. Um, and uh, what's really remarkable to me uh, about the Red Sea is, is how beautiful the, the fish are there. There's a lot of fish that are unique to the Red Sea because it's kind of separated from the rest of the Indian Ocean by a very narrow strait. And uh, the endemic fish there, they tend to be very colorful in a, in a different way. They have tones of, of color that the other fish don't have in general. This is one of my favorites, Chitin palsy fasciatus, um, red and white butterfly fish, um, endemic to the Red Sea, and it's absolutely stunning. The Red Sea is one of the most beautiful fauna um, I've ever, ever seen. Highly recommend it if you're a diver and you haven't been there. Um, the conditions for diving there are, are amazingly good too. If you go there during the summer, the water is really hot, so you don't you just need a, a lycra skin, if that. Um, I can just do I, most of the diving I did there was just board shorts and a rash guard. Um, so it's very comfortable diving, very easy. There's no strong currents. There usually the, the sea is calm because it's very narrow, so there's not a lot of wind action going on. Um, and and uh, sadly, I also photographed gobies there, those nasty little things. I mean, this one is trying, he's trying to be pretty. Look at that pink eye, but he's not, he's a nasty goby, nasty. Um, then after going to the Red Sea quite a few times, the whole story comes to a closure and I come to the California Academy of Sciences. So I started working here 2011. Um, uh, uh, when I was at Texas, I wasn't really looking for a job. Um, it, was, it was a really nice department. The colleagues were great. Uh, the university was great. The university of Texas is a great university. Um, but I always had this, this, this dream of working, being a curator at a natural history collection. And, and, um, and the biggest collections in the world, in the US for sure, and in the world are the, the American Museum of Natural History, the Smithsonian, the Field Museum, and the California Academy of Sciences. So they're the, the top collections um, in the whole world. And then every ichthyologist that I know um, dreams to work in those places. So 
even though I was comfortable in Texas, when I saw a job open for an ichthyologist at the California Academy of Sciences, I, I applied for it. And I lucky I was very lucky to, to get the job here. Um, it was highly competitive because, again, every ichthyologist I know wants to come here. But somehow, people like me. And, um, and uh, here I am. Um, love working here. Uh, the best place I've lived. Um, we've moved. If you watched from the beginning, we moved a lot. And uh, this is the, the place I like the most of all of them, the ones that I've been to, uh, both from a professional and a personal, and a personal perspective. Um, so going back to the crazy story trips, uh, one of the first trips um, I did when I joined the academy was to Socotra, Yemen. Um, if you haven't heard about that, this place, Google it. It's amazing. It's an island south of Yemen. Um, it's closer to Somalia than it is to Yemen, but it belongs to Yemen. And I went there with Joey Di Battista, or called my colleague that is now at the uh, Australian Museum. He's the fish curator there. So he got the same job that I did, except in Sydney. And um, uh, Tane, which is a photographer buddy and, and biologist extraordinaire and Sparky, who's now in Oman. And the four of us, we went into this adventure. So remember, Brazil, borrowed cameras. That's the, how much of a roller coaster this is. Octopus, whole bunch of trips in between now, Socotra. And this is the places we were staying in Socotra. So we had a couple of uh, four wheel drive trucks and we were just driving from beach to beach and um, camping in those makeshift shelters that were for fishermen and we were using them we spent four days in this one and then we moved to the next one we spent another four days um so this is more um of a typical expedition not a typical expedition i think the typical expedition is neither one actually this is too much on the adventure side the the one in the octopus was too much on the crazy luxurious side i think maybe the typical expedition would be staying on a holiday inn and, and uh, going, renting a boat and going diving every day. That would be the typical expedition. So camping like this is more on the adventure side, uh, the exception. And, uh, and the luxury of the, of the octopus is in the other extreme of it. But this was one of the greatest expeditions I've ever done uh, to Socotra, not only because of the, how nice it was underwater, but also because of how nice it was outside of the water. It was just stunning. The island, the beauty of the island was stunning and underwater was stunning. Um, there was a lot of fish that we hadn't seen before, a lot of hybrids, uh, crosses. And one of the things that called our attention the most was the amount of large fish. So we saw a lot of large fish in the, um, in the island. And I think one of the reasons was because the fishing there, was done in the most traditional way I've ever seen. The canoes were just, they, they had, they, they fished, but they had, all the canoes, they only had paddles. They didn't have any en engines because they couldn't afford the engines. Um, they didn't have nets for the, the most part. They only had hook and line. So it was a very primitive way of fishing. And that, um, that allowed them uh, to fish in a, in a very sustainable way. So they, they got enough that they needed to eat, but not much to sell. And that the end result was that there was a lot of fish on the reef, including very large groupers that we barely, hardly ever see anywhere else. So we did this expedition. And a few years later, we wanted to go back there to do a second expedition with, uh, with a larger team and staying a little longer. And uh, we couldn't do it because Yemen descended into a, it was civil war. Um, so we, instead, we went to Somalia. Huh. Somaliland, which was super exciting also. Um, that's the team that we went to Somaliland. That's Tane, Joey, uh, uh, JP, Hobbs, and I. And uh, we spent two weeks in Somaliland. Again, because it, they, they fished there the same way that they fished in Socotra, there was a lot of fish. It was one of the few trips I didn't take an underwater camera with me. And the, the story I wanted to tell you about this trip was this one. Um, we were driving back and forth to go diving. Uh, and after four or five days or so, I started noticing we, we were crossing this, this desert kind of area. And I started noticing if you look, if you squint and look really closely, there's two blue dots. So this is a photo I took from the, uh, from the passenger seat in the, in the, the four-wheel drive we were using. 
And uh, there, the two blue dots there are two rocks that are planted blue. And I finally asked the driver, what are the blue rocks for? Are they just to mark the, to mark the road here? And he's like, no, 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 it's to mark the minefield. <laughs> if we go out of this, these blue rocks, it's a minefield. So we cross this whole minefield every day to go to the dive site. Crazy, crazy trip. I mean, again, I could spend the whole day talking to you about travel and, and crazy story from trips. So um, after this trip, um, we started more and more uh, getting into deep diving. And uh, this is Elliot Chesup and I. Elliot was a dive officer at the Academy at the time. Um, and we started diving rebreathers. And I feel like everybody kind of knows the rest of the story. We started going deeper and deeper, which is something that I wanted to do since I started back in Brazil in the 80s. Always wanted to go deeper. Always wanted to explore. Always wanted to find the new things. And um, uh, started another dream come true of mine was working with, um, so that's on the foreground there. It's Brian Green on, with the, the green hat. Then I'm in the middle there with the blue shirt. Uh, the next over after me is Rich Pyle. So I only dreamed about working with these guys growing up and um, ended up working with them constantly. We described a lot of species together. Uh, this is one of the expeditions we did together to the Philippines. And as I started going deeper, I, I started um, facing kind of a different challenge. I started flooding my cameras. Um, so I had to switch cameras because the, the, I started exceeding the maximum depth of the, of the housings. I started switching cameras. So that, I remember I showed you that Subal, that uh, uh, housing that I uh, used. This is the housing I use now. And this is a Nauticam for the D500, the Nikon D500 that I already showed. And it's kind of scratched up and, and you can't quite see it, but here's right, it says right here, 150 meters. So this one is specially made housing to withstand the depth that we go to, which is 150 meters or so, 500 feet. Um, and then I, that's when I started, I stopped uh, uh, flooding cameras and, uh, started being able to actually take good pictures at those deeper, deeper depths, all the way down to 500 feet. This is one of the first deep ones I took in the Philippines. Uh, those are some Harlequin groupers, one of my favorite grouper species that only show up in those deeper, deeper reefs, the mesophotic reefs that I talked about in the last, in the last talk. The team started growing. We started training more people. This is the, the current, um, the cur somewhat current team right now that we have in my, in my lab uh, doing those deep dives. So this is the, we call it the deep team. There's a lot more people in the, Siri's thinking I'm talking to her. Shut up, Siri. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, this is the current deep diving team. So that's Bart with the hammer. Bart is the director of the Steinhardt Aquarium. Uh, Maridius is doing the funny face there. He's the dive safety officer at the academy. Uh, Tyler on the blue shirt, he, that was when he was accepted at the master's program at San Francisco State, so he took that photo to celebrate it. Uh, Hudson uh, with the gray shirt, uh, it was a PhD student at the time, he's now a postdoc at the lab, we, start, we still work together a lot. And, um, and I'm on the, the other corner there, this was in Guam, I think, when um, Tyler was accepted into the program. Um, so Hudson and I described this stunning little fish. Claudia was uh, a co-author with us in that, in that paper too. Claudia did all of the genetics. She's the genetics wizard in the lab. Um, she sequenced the DNA and we showed it was different. Um, and we just embarked in this adventure of finding, discovering and collecting and describing these stunning drool kind of species of fish. This one we named Tosanoides Aphrodite in honor of the Greek goddess of beauty, because I couldn't think of anything more beautiful than this, this fish. Um, we described Cyrilabras Wakanda. We named it after Wakanda because well, purple, it's from Africa, it remained hidden for many, many, many years. Um, so Wakanda, right? Um, there's a lot of fish that we haven't described yet. The next one I'm gonna show, I don't think I've ever shown publicly anywhere because it doesn't have a name yet. And I don't like, 
showing species that don't have names yet, but I took such a good picture of it that I think it's worth showing. And uh, Rich Pyle is describing it because he found it before we did, but we took the, I took the good picture and I hope he uses this picture in his description, but I think it's one of the most beautiful fish I've ever seen. It's for, from the genus Odontantius. Um, doesn't have a name yet, but it's stunning. Something that looks almost like out of this planet. Um, this one is a picture we took in our last expedition, the, the one we did, the, the most recent one that we did to Brazil. So I already introduced everybody in this picture except for Alison, who is beside me there. She's another dive officer at the Academy. Um, and if you look below the Academy sign there, that's all that gear. So one of the, the things people ask me a lot is how can you take pictures? How can you dive with that much gear, that much stuff attached to you? How can you do it? So much training, so much gear. And, and Bart and I, Bart on the other side of the photo there with the gray shirt, um, we talk about this all the time because it takes, it's an effort. It's, it's a metric ton of gear, literally. It takes a lot of effort to get there. The training is, is arduous. The diving is arduous. It's super expensive. Um, it's taxing. At the end of the expedition, your body is, the whole body aches. Um, it's mentally draining because it's a very high risk activity. I'm always thinking about the safety of the team. Um, and uh, every time when, when we're, it's that whole build up to start diving and we do all of our checklists, we pull all our gear on, and more often than not, Bart look at a, a Bart and I look at each other and we say, "Why? Why do we do this? Why do we do this? It's so much effort." And then we we go down, and we come back like this. So this is Bart. Um, that fish that you see there on the on the side on the opposite side of his hand, that one that looks like a little peppermint. It's a peppermint angelfish. It's one that we recently collected. Um, in French Polynesia, and we brought back alive to our exhibit here at the California Academy of Sciences. And um, this is why we do it. I mean, there's nothing more thrilling than bringing up these species that almost nobody has ever seen and showing them to the public. So this very fish now is displayed on the public floor at the Academy. Um, in our Twilight Zone exhibit, and one's one of the most beautiful fish I've ever seen. And it has a curious story behind it too. So I'm gonna spend my last 30 seconds telling this story and then I'm gonna open up for, sec for questions. But um, when we, we set out to do this exhibit at the Academy, the Twilight Zone exhibit, um, the, 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 the exhibit's team, they came up with a game. There's an interactive game that you kind of swim around and try to catch a fish in the public floor. And, um, and they asked us, oh, we're gonna make a lot of fish and we're going to put these, uh, we're going to give different scores to the different fish. So tell us which is a, a common fish with a low score and a, and a really pretty fish with a super high score. And the prettiest fish of the whole game, the one that if you catch, you get the most points, it's this one. But the curious story about it is that we've been doing this for the best part of five years. And we haven't had, we didn't have this fish anywhere alive in the, academy, in the exhibit, except for in that game. And finally, last year, we went to French Polynesia and we came back and we brought it back to the Academy. And now it's an ambassador to, to its entire species. I mean, it's, it's showing the beauty and the, the uniqueness of this ecosystem that all of us strive to keep going, to conserving, to preserving, to having it around for many, many more millions of years. And with that, I will open up for questions if I have time. I spoke too much, sorry. No, it's I fine. Get, I get too enthusiastic about this. No, it was awesome. It's the We're crazy story. And I told you, right? I had I had the 150 slides in this presentation, and I, I, I <laughs> take it. I took it down to like I think I have 45 now. So, you can imagine if I had 150, I could spend the whole day talking about it. I mean, I feel like you know, it's the internet. People can log off and walk away if they want to. Like, let's just Sounds let's good. just take all the questions. Yeah. <laughs> also, good. I'm like so that so first of all. I'm shocked that that was the first private yacht you've ever encountered as a scientist who works for a nonprofit. That like that was just the doesn't first make sense private to me. Yacht. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I really I appreciate that they named it the octopus. Like they do. Like if you have a giant private yacht, you have like a James Bond responsibility to name it appropriately, and I think they checked that box. So Sounds that's good. Cool story. <laughs> um, 
Cool story. And also, so I'm a little confused because you said that you hate gobies because they're just so small that your aging eyes can't see them. But I did like a really quick Google search and like Blenny's kind of look like the same size. So I feel like there's hidden trauma. We you haven't- can, No, you can tell them <laughs> apart. The Blenny's, you can tell them apart. But they're small, right? They're still they are small. small. They're small, yeah. But they're more, they're more I, th I think to my eyes, they're a little bit more distinctive from each other. Okay. Yeah. All right. there's, just... there's some groups of grobies like the genus Trima, Dreamus Eviota. There's like hundreds of species in these genera that nobody can tell apart except for a few crazy goby people. Yeah. I guess like every <laughs> every like department or every like field of like natural sciences has something like that. Like the one the thing that's just really plentiful but super small and everybody hates it and yeah, size heavily. Pretty much. <laughs> Um, okay, re questions, real questions. This one from Chris. What is the hardest animal you photographed and what was the scariest? Ooh, huh. The scariest is by far the Titan triggerfish. Um, so it's this massive triggerfish um, that uh, occur in the Indo-Pacific and they are super aggressive and they will chase you, they will <laughs> bite you. And I was trying to take a picture of one and it charged on me and I, I swam away with my camera pointing at it and it charged at the camera and then it came down and bit my fin, bit the tip of the fin, it took a bite out of the fin um, in one of our trips to the Great Barrier Reef. Um, how big are so, they? So yeah, that's they definitely they scary. They they get to about uh, a foot or two long, but they are oh. mean. They're mean <laughs> bastards. Um, so that was the scariest. Not a shark. I'm usually not scared of sharks. Um, not the mores don't scare. No, it's just that yeah, the Titan trigger fish. It's particularly aggressive. They usually they make these mount. The nests are mounds, so they make nests and um, they are really protective of their nests. So if you get close, they will chase you down. Doesn't matter how big you are. And, uh, and they, they can take bites off. Sometimes they attack people because they allow people to get close. They're, they're big, so they're not afraid of anything. Right. And when people get close, since it's not a shark, they approach too much and then the, the fish try to, to get them. Okay, so your get closer tip for photography doesn't doesn't extend. Not to these for guys. the Titan tree. No. <laughs> okay, um, we got a couple questions. Andy, Kiani, a few others who were all just curious about whether the camera flash affects fish eyes. It behavior. doesn't. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't. In general, it doesn't. Some get scared of it and they kind of turn away, swim away. Um, but there was a study done specifically because of seahorses. So there's a tiny pygmy seahorses that yeah. people, that photographers love photographing. I have a few pictures of one. And um, sometimes people go specifically to places in, in Indonesia or the Philippines to photograph those seahorses. And, and it's a line, you can see a line of photographers, like 10 photographers, one behind the other to photograph this one seahorse. So it's just one photographer comes in, takes 10 pictures, then the other one, then the other one. And there's this, this constant flow of photographers and it's just banging the flesh on the, the, the face of the seahorse. And um, there was a study that was done um, to see if they changed behavior, or if, they, if they affected their eyes, and it concluded that it doesn't. Um, it kind of makes them a little mad. Like, I mean, the same way, I guess, the, the celebrities do when there's paparazzi taking a million pictures of them. Um, but uh, it's not damaging to their health in, in any way. So okay. there you have it. Yeah, interesting. The lineup of people trying to snap a pygmy seahorse reminds me of like yeah. the lineup to Everest or something. Mm. Um, so Nicole asks, which camera model do you recommend for a beginner in underwater photography? Obviously a Nikon. Yeah, it depends. Obviously, You've, if like, you're, if you're, our chances yeah. of ever getting a Canon no, sponsorship. No, Canon, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> if it's my goby of cameras, it's Canon. <laughs> if you... Um, if, if the intent is to photograph fish, I highly recommend a, a DSLR, so a digital SLR like the one I have, um, mostly because of shorter lag. So when you have one of those point and shoot cameras, it's super high quality. Sometimes you can't even tell apart from a, a DSLR in terms of quality. But uh, the biggest advantage of the DSLR is that when you press the shutter, it takes the picture. Mm -hmm. So it's immediate, there's no shutter lag. Uh, there's no difference in time between when you press the shutter and it takes the picture. Um, and it's very important for fish because if you want to take the fish, a fish picture when the fish is posing nicely in a certain angle, 
and there's nothing more frustrating than pressing the shutter and the camera taking the pictures. Like even if it's a, I don't know, 20 microseconds yeah. later, it's going to be a fish tail. Right. <laughs> um, so point and shoots are really good for coral photos or scenic photos, or if you want to photograph a diver, or if you want to just take a pictures of the scene around you, they're really good for that. And they're a lot smaller packages too. But if you want to take like really good, serious fish photos, I think a DSLR is a most still, it's a must have still. Okay. Any quick tips for as far as housing goes? Um, whichever one you can afford. Um, the more expensive ones usually are, are, they have better controls, but you can take good pictures of any. I mean, I had really bad ones before and I still took nice pictures of it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. This is, this is kind of, this is kind of related, but just in case you have any extra advice, Tomas asked, um, whether like basically just how to start underwater photography on a low, lower budget. Used. Get used stuff, um, especially now. Back in the day, when the film market was still going, it was it was a little bit harder because if you wanted a, a top of the line camera, um, it was still very expensive because it, it, the top of the line cameras there were film cameras, so there was no technological mm -hmm. advances. There were no cameras, but now with the digital ones, there's a new one coming out every few years. There's a new right. one every few years. There's a new one. So the the D five hundred is on the end of the end of the the cycle right now. And when they, they, they finish the line for the D500, they will probably introduce something like the D600 or the next model. Everybody is going to go out and buy that model, all of the big name photographers, because they want the, the latest and greatest. And then they sell all of their excellent ones mm -hmm. really cheap because they're digital, right? So they're disposable in many ways. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So used, um, used is easy, it's a lot cheaper. Okay. Uh, Jake asks, aside from species whose behavior tells you when to dive, are there certain times of day or night when reef creatures are more likely to be active? Yes, that's a good question. Um, uh, so that dusk and dawn time is really good for photography. A lot of things are active, especially um, in the morning, uh, early, early morning, like right after the sun goes up, there's a lot of activity in the reef. A lot of predators come out to hunt because they're hungry overnight. And um, then the middle of the day, everything calms down. And then towards the end of the day, it starts picking up again. Um, so for wide angle in general, the middle of the day is better because you get the nicer light. Mm -hmm. But for fish behavior and, and, and critters that usually tend to hide, either super early or as close to sunset as possible is, is better. OK, cool. Uh, and Kelly, she wants some numbers. How many species have you discovered? Ooh. <laughs> I should have counted it. I should have expected that. You don't just don't know, know that? I mean, no. that's kind of impressive that you don't just know, I guess. That's like cooler I'd than knowing. I about 30. I have but like count. all very, you only bother to describe the really pretty ones, right? No, no I described you have the goby one. steadily. Yeah. One goby. <laughs> I have a really ugly one coming out. The goby was, because it was the one I described, mm -hmm. it's pretty. It's not as, yeah, not as bad yeah, as the other. Not as nasty, really. no. Yeah. no. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I have a, a damsel fish coming out that Bart is the first author and it's an ugly one. Very right, okay. Follow me on Twitter to, to see it when it comes out. <laughs> yeah. You won't even like bear to have it on your screen. You'll just be like, oh God. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Nasty. Okay. Lisa says or asks, besides having a good camera, what do you think is the next most important piece of equipment when it comes to taking amazing photos? Light. Good strobes. Good, reliable strobes. Um, I, in, in the, the beginning too, I had a lot of problems with strobes because they were connected to the to the housing by uh, electric cables. But now there's some strobes that you can connect with optical cables. Oh. Uh, so it's just they're waterproof. I mean, it's just a, a tube, a yeah. fiberglass tube that transmits light. Yeah. So th there's no water. There's no electric, and yeah. they, they can be exposed to water um so that's not a problem so with the electric cables it was they were always super unreliable because they would flood and then they'd stop transmitting the, the signal between the camera and the strobe and then you'd have no strobe and then you have no photos so you have to have really good light the strobes they have to be like super fast recycling because sometimes you want to take like five photos of the same fish going over to get the nice pose yeah. um so the more the faster the recycling time of the strobe the better and uh optical connection between the camera and the and the strobe is makes things a lot uh, a lot better especially if you want to go deep yeah one thing that i was curious about is when you were showing those photos that had the really really rich black background 
was there just no, like there's no backscatter at all there, obviously. Was that water just incredibly clear or was it how you had your strobes positioned? It's a little bit of both. Okay. Um, there's always some backscatter, backscatter in the water, and, but um, if it's not too much, you can, depending on how you angle the strobes. So if you don't angle them in a way that they reflect the backscatter, if you angle mm -hmm. them in a way that they reflect mostly the subject, which is usually like angled towards the inside and up like that, instead of just facing the, the subject directly, then they, they, they light mostly the subject and not the, and not the background. But if there's too much backscatter, then yeah. it's, it, yeah. it shows it's up anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's worth mentioning with all this stuff, whether it's like have, taking time to like properly adjust your gear or getting being able to like get close enough you actually have to be a really good diver to do all this stuff like to make to have True. the point you want and to like True. be calm enough True. to adjust stuff True. so that's like should True. be added to your tips thing based on oh, some yeah. of the very crappy underwater photos i've taken <laughs> it pays to be able to hold still yeah um okay so andy was really curious about your when you mentioned diving in the marshall islands did you have to take any pre precautions for radiation he asks no, so uh, for as part of that documentary that I mentioned, they also had, uh, so they had me as a biologist and they had a, a, a physicist that had one of those radiation counters, the Geiger counter to measure background radiation in bikini. And um, the, the background had radiation there was much higher than what it was supposed to be in a remote island like that, but it was equivalent to a big city. So there's there's things oh, wow. in San Francisco that, that generate radiation and, and um, that gets up to a, a level that is not dangerous, which is right now what we what's the case in Bikini, except for if you go to, there's places where they have piles of exploded, unexploded ordinances and exploded close things that are really close to where the bombs really exploded, they move them to a trash pile and then put a concrete dome over it. If you go mm -hmm. close to there, then the background radiation is bigger. but outside of those contained areas, um, it's, not, it's not too bad. They still, they're still advising people not to plant anything in the island and not to eat the, eat the fish from there, but I think it's at a level that um, it's probably acceptable. I don't know if I would eat any fish from there, but. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, uh, Madeline just said, it's wonderful to be quarantined with ichthyology. That is very sweet, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'll ask you like, I'll ask, also, there's a lot of people saying you're secret that you secretly really love gobies. So I don't know. I'll just leave that with you. But um, Milika asked, "How much editing do you normally do with your photos?" I have very little patience for editing. So if it's not a good photo to begin with, and it takes me more than I don't know five or ten minutes to edit, I just don't bother. <laughs> yeah, and I guess it depends what you're using it for too, right? Like if it's right, like, if yeah. I'm using it, if it's oh, like if it's a unique photo of a species that I'm trying to describe for a paper, then I'll spend a lot of time editing it. But if mm -hmm. it's um, if it's just a pretty fish and, and I want to show it on social media, something like that, if it's not a good quality enough that I can edit it in five minutes or so, just change the color balance and, and um, make it look nicer a little bit, then I, I discard it. <laughs> 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 I don't delete it. I don't delete anything though. I have, yeah. I have it all. So the 50,000 photo library I have, it's all, all photos, ugly ones, pretty ones. Yeah. And um, I, I always save them as records for the trips and, and the locations I've been to. Right. Yeah. Because if you're going back to the same place, you would take a look at what you had seen last time. Yeah. Right. Okay. So Danielle asks, we always get these photos. It's like the white whale photo. Is there a photo that you missed or just haven't gotten yet that you never stop thinking about? There is one that I missed that I never stopped thinking about that um, <laughs> you were there, I think, for that. Yeah. One of the trips we did to the Philippines uh -huh. um, with Elliot and Brian, and we were in Puerto Galera. We were diving in Verde Island. And oh, there yeah. was a dive. So Elliot had that big camera, but there was a dive that he, he couldn't go to for some reason. So it was just uh, Bart, Hudson, and I. And... Um, because it was just the three of us, I didn't take a camera. Oh, I know what this is. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't take a camera because um, I had to collect fish. I had to count fish. So yeah. I didn't take a camera. Um, yeah. And lo and behold, uh, the, the white whale happens, right? So we did this fantastic dive to about 400 feet or so in the very tip of Verde Island and the Verde Island Passage in the Philippines. 
And as we finished counting our fish, we finished collected, collecting everything we needed, um, we started going up. And when we look up to the ledge at about 100 feet above us, so at about 300 feet depth, there were these three massive pressure sharks. Yeah. So we saw so that cool. silhouette looking up. And it was one of the most incredible views I've ever had. And, and uh, the only one that had a camera was Hudson. And everybody, Bart and I yelled at him, Hudson, Hudson, look at the shark, look at the shark. And he looked at the shark and we were all stunned by like them for, I don't know, 10 or 15 yeah. seconds or so. And Hudson pulled his camera, as he pulled his camera and, and he pointed it to them, which was was going to be bad anyways, because it was just a GoPro, but they just swam off. Yeah. Out of there, Yeah, there's, and for people who have, well, you should just Google it if you don't know what it is. Pressure shark, like. yeah. It's yeah. one of the most beautiful sharks there is and I still yeah. don't have a photo of it. Yeah. Oh man. That's it was cool. the only time I saw them, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I'll do this last one, which is a nice one to end with from Maybell, who says, your adventures are amazing. Do you have any advice for aspiring ichthyologists out there like, like her? Nice. Um, do it. Um, persevere. Stay at it. Don't let anything slow you down. Um, and, and by that, I mean, pursue your passion. Um, even if you if you don't like diving and you want to be a marine biologist, there's a lot of people out there that uh, don't dive. Um, one of the biggest names in marine biology is Gary Vermey. He's a professor at um, at UC Davis. His papers are absolutely fantastic, and he's blind mm. from oh, wow. five years old, so he's never seen any of the creatures. That. He studies mm -hmm. mollusks, and he. Um, he knows their shapes because the, because the shell. So he, he can feel the shape of the shell. And he has these most incredible papers, one of the best marine biologists in the world. And he followed his passion. So you don't need to dive. You don't need to. I mean, I had to. My biggest hurdle in becoming a marine biologist was seasickness. Yeah. Um, I, I made it look nicely in the in the when I was talking about it, but it wasn't that it wasn't that pretty when it was happening. Yeah. I mean, I was so debilitated sometimes that I had to just lay down. And the first time I went out after I did my first open water diving course, we went out to the to the actual dive and I didn't dive. I was so seasick that I couldn't stand up in the boat. Oh, yeah. It must have been and, pretty uh, crashing. Yeah. And I kept I kept at it. I kept going and I kept going yeah. and and I didn't have I didn't have money to go diving. That's why I became a dive master. So I could use the the the, the boat from the dive shop. It was part of my salary was just free dives. Yeah. Um, um, so, yeah, I mean, become a biologist. You don't need a specific degree in marine biology. So you can just get a more general biology degree. You don't need to go to a famous program or a famous university. You just need to pursue your passion and be good at it. And make sure you like and are good at writing and math and all of those things that have nothing to do with fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great, Maybell. I hope you're inspired. Everyone else, I hope you are too. Um, and for anyone who does want to hear more about the Academy Scientific Diving Programs, we're going to have um, Meridius Bell, who's the Academy, who is the Academy's Dive Safety Officer, on Breakfast Club Tuesday, May fifth at ten a.m. So nice. you can come back and hear that. Uh, in between that, we have Jack Dumbacher, our Curator of Mammalogy and Ornithology, on Thursday, this Thursday at ten a.m., talking about the deep forest owls of the Pacific Northwest. But Louise, that was awesome. Thank uh, you. So we'll sign you up to come back and do the 150 slide two hour version for the people that can't get enough. <laughs> That's Perfect. not true, we're not gonna do that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much. And thanks to everybody who tuned in. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.